I have to say this because I was mentioning this to some other, someone else recently. I said, you know, what's different now is that we're here. And what's different now yeah. is that, you know, children of immigrants like I am, you know, we're not just attorneys. Some of us are partners and some of us yeah. have our own podcasts and some of us publish books and now we're elected officials. No one's going back to the bus. No one's going back into the kitchen. No one's going back in the closet. And that's something that white supremacy is having a huge problem with, Danielle, is that they have to contend with us. I mean, but the fact is, is that they don't want to contend with us. They want to erase us. And that is, you know, where we find ourselves. And I think, you know, Clay, I want to give you the opportunity to kind of lay out the premise of your book um, to our listeners, um, because I think that we oftentimes, or maybe I'll just speak for myself, try to ignore, laugh at, look away from um, Black Republicans. And what I will say is this, as a Black queer woman, as a child of immigrants, anytime that I have met a Black Republican, they have tried to shame me for aligning myself with what they have referred to as, quote, the Democratic plantation, which you name Mm. and lift up uh, in the introduction to your book. So I want to give you an opportunity to talk about the insidious nature and grift of Black Republicans that is very different than Republicans at large. Um, Because I do believe that what you have laid out is the danger right? The danger that it isn't just the buffoonery. It isn't just, you know, the, the negation of blackness. It isn't something to look away from because what we have seen in the last few presidential cycles is this clawing away of black men, right? Uh, from the democratic party and kind of ushering them into, uh, the Republican party. So, so give us this, this, the 50,000 foot view and the window of of why black republicans needed to be the center focus of your book the grift well what i wanted to do is i wanted to expose frauds and honor heroes and one of the things that i've said promoting this book i've said how did black republicans go from frederick douglas to clarence thomas how did black republicans go from jackie robinson who was a powerful person in politics after he leaves baseball to Herschel Walker. Mm. How did we get here? And what I document is that it it is a downward spiral. It is a long time in the making. And it's not only a downward spiral of black Republicans, but a downward spiral of racial politics in the GOP. And, you know, they they often say Democratic plantation, but they often go back to, well, we used to be Republicans. We were Republicans. And if this were the 1860s, all of us would be Republican, obviously. Right. So being that we had this erasure and this attack on our history, I wanted to show what the original black Republicans were. They believed in race conscious policies. They believed in race specific policies. They believed in in an economy that would upload, uh, uplift black communities. They believed in public education. They believed in actually telling our history. Frederick Douglass, Ida B. Wells, they are rolling in their graves at what we have today. And the reason why it's important that we don't ignore it is because the current crop of black Republicans, they play a certain role. They provide racial cover mm-hmm. for racism in the GOP. So if Senator Tim Scott says there's no reason for a Voting Rights Act. There isn't racism at at the voting booth. Well, it it must be okay because a black guy is saying it. When you have Herschel Walker getting a higher percentage of the white evangelical vote when he ran for senator in Georgia than Ted Budd did in North Carolina, that's disturbing. So one of the key things that a lot of us made a mistake was ignoring Clarence Thomas. I have Mm -hmm. this in the book. He really is the watershed moment in the grift. Before him, there were some black Republicans who policy-wise, I I wasn't really with them, but it wasn't this shaming, this debasing of black people. Clarence Thomas was the remix. He's somebody who was against affirmative action, but admits affirmative action saved his life. He is somebody who shames his own sister 
and more or less doesn't use the exact word, but characterizes her as a welfare queen, his own Mm. flesh and blood. And he is elevated for this. He is the first Supreme Court justice that did not get a unanimous rating from the American Bar Association. But he knew the role. He was to be the anti-Clarence Thomas. And the blueprint that he laid out, you see so many other folks following it. So I go through the whole process. And then some folks were in the GOP. Then they leave. They're kicked out. You know, they have their come to Jesus moment. Colin Powell was famously booed at the 2000 RNC convention when he mentions affirmative action. I have a robust interview with Michael Steele in the book. But now what we have, truly dangerous. Uh, The GOP is not going to make a Herschel Walker mistake. Now you have Mark Robinson in North Carolina. You know, they're not going to make a Larry Elder mistake. A Daniel Cameron in Kentucky is not done yet. The role they play It is to actively dismantle civil rights. And this book in many ways uh, goes beyond the R and the D and goes beyond black or white. Because look at Nikki Haley. She is not, at one point she said she was white. She is not a black woman. But you see the role that she is playing. It's the lengths that people will go for proximity and access to power. And part of that agreement, part of that blood oath is you will shame and you will hurt your own community. And in the book, I focus on people who have significant power, not some of the clowns on social media, people who are gunning for actual power. It is dangerous. You know, you think of Handmaid's Tale. The famous character in it is uh, is, um, Serena Waterford. She was a woman who was fighting against women being able to have equal rights. And she was elevated for that. It's the same kind of a potion. So that was my reason for writing it. I wanted to expose these frauds and to not ignore it. Rosa Parks said, watch out for Clarence Thomas. And other people like someone I love and adore, like Maya Angelou, she supported Clarence Thomas because they didn't think he'd be that bad. They thought when he would get in there, he would do the right thing. So now it's on steroids. It is um, it is scary and it's important to call these people out. And lastly, I'll say I think about Ida B. Wells. She said, the way to right wrongs is to shine the light of truth upon them. Mm -hmm. I consider this book shining my light of truth. Mm -hmm. No, we really appreciate it. And I'm glad you mentioned Nikki Haley because I see so many similarities. And if you're a person of color and know anything about American history, the the greatest uh, grift cultural validator is a black man or a black woman because then they can invalidate. Uh, the lived experiences and pain and frustration of all people of color, and then they end up validating white supremacy. They become enforcers of white supremacy. But as you've mentioned in the past few years, the folks who have really emerged within the GOP are South Asians. Nikki Haley, Vivek Ramaswamy, Kash Patel, right? Model minorities, right? The ones who get to attack both South Asians, immigrants of color, and black people. And they're the ones who come in and say, look, 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 there's a place for me in the Republican Party. What racism? No racism, right? And it's so dangerous. Uh, And and you mentioned the word grift. And I want to get back to that because based upon your research, how much of this, Clay, is a calculated, cynical ploy for, like you said, access to power? And how much is it? Well, they ain't talking about me, right? I'm the good mm-hmm. one. You know, I'm right. the special one because I've heard both about Clarence. Clarence thinks oh, I'm the good one. I'm the special one. It's it's the liberals who betrayed me. And then at the same time, well, I'll take this yacht trip and yeah. uh, I'll get this new nice little property deal. And and I say what I say this with the emergence. And I don't want you to get into hot water if you don't want to talk about it. But I'm telling folks I have a good radar about this. I told people to be wary about Candace Owens. I said she's going to blow up. They didn't take pay attention to her. Look at her now. And there's a new guy, Coleman Hughes, who came out with a book called The End of Race Politics, Arguments for a Colorblind America. And I don't know if you've been following him, Daniel, but this guy is all over the place, says he's not a conservative, but guess who loves him? Right wing and conservatives. So unpack that for us. Yeah, so uh, when you think of a grift, it's not brainless. Uh, there is an exchange, right? Uh, it is tactical. There is a strategy behind it. And, you know, what am I going to get in return? It has no morals. It has no ethics. It is an exchange of hope 
that I will be elevated, right? Now, in the 19th century, believe it or not, I cover this in the book, there were some key people after Reconstruction, a guy named Isaiah Montgomery in Mississippi in 1890, who votes against Black men being able to vote. And he was elevated in the media at the time. They said he was a he was a credit to his race. Booker T. Washington. You know, we lo- we love Booker T, but I, I dive into some of the things that people don't know about him, that in many ways he said we should accept being second class citizens um, and bow down to to uh, to a uh, white rule. So the the grift is uh, an exchange of proximity to power. Right now, some people aren't as smart. Uh, some people, they go on the apology tour like Stacey Dash or Amarosa. Uh, Or some people like J.C. Watts will have a come to Jesus moment and say, in order to be a Republican, a black Republican, you've got to denounce your experiences as as an African-American. That's what he said. Some people have just contributed to it. I think of someone like Condoleezza Rice. Uh, It is she's complicated because she has the skills. You know, she she's she has the degrees. She's obviously a smart woman, but she um, toes the 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 uh, GOP line. And one has to ask if she were a Democrat, would she have had that kind of access? She actually has a a sister who is um, who I believe is a civil rights lawyer. And you don't hear about her in the same kind of way because black liberals, black Democrats, we come a dime a dozen. So it shortens the line. Mm. I mean, in the opening to my book, I talk about a former friend of mine who said, I'm going to come out as a conservative. And he did. And he got elevated very quickly. So I think it shortens the line. It gives you access. And no one wants to do the actual work. You know, if you sell your soul, then what are you going to get in return? And some folks even after the look at Candace Owens, she's trying to rebrand now. That's right. She, you know, this is, this is somebody who we made heinous comments about Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey. And this is part of the reason why I wrote the book, because part of the grift is when the grift falls apart. 